we've been in this series that I've called the gifts of Christmas and really looking at the gift, uh, which is Jesus. And the idea that God the Father has been working since the very beginning to draw our attention to Christ. Uh, for you Bible students, we've been taking a deep dive in some Old Testament uh, stories that prefigured and shadowed the coming Messiah. And we've seen through Old Testament scriptures the story of Jesus, his life, his birth, uh, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And we've kind of unpacked some, some of the things that aren't as clearly seen so that we can more readily see what is clearly seen. And then last week, I, we talked about the simplicity of the story of the Messiah, Jesus, as told in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe in him but not perish but have everlasting life. And we took a real deep dive into where that was fleshed out in the Old Testament. The point of it all is this that God is always at work to draw our attention to Jesus. He is not limited. God is not limited to ancient times. He's not limited just to ancient scriptures. Uh, but he is constantly, even in our day and age, continuing to orchestrate events and scenarios that if we're paying attention, will draw our attention to Jesus. Uh, so much so that uh, back in 1987, there was a, a young woman who was, she and her husband were missionaries in the Philippines, and she became pregnant, and it was a very difficult pregnancy. She fell into a coma, nearly died. She came out, and her doctors recommended that she have an abortion. She, of course, chose not to. And she eventually gave birth to a little boy named Tim. And Tim grew up loving Jesus. He grew up knowing that his life was much more uh, than uh, simply pursuing his hopes and dreams of this world. He grew up knowing that his life was intended to draw attention to Jesus. Uh, and eventually that led him to the football field. Tim Tebow, on January 8, 2009, was the quarterback of the Florida Gators in the national championship game against the Oklahoma Sooners, in which the Florida Gators won that game 24 to 14. And during that game, Tim wrote on the eye black under his eye, John under his right eye, and 316 under his left eye. As a result of that, some 90 million people Googled John 3.16 to figure out what that said. Resulting from that was the following year, the NCAA outlawed any writing on iBlack. Tim knew that his life was much more than just football. He knew that his life was intended to draw people's attention to Jesus. John 3.16 was his favorite verse. Three years to the day after that game and that eye black, on January 8th, 2012, Tim was again the quarterback on a nationally televised game, this time as the quarterback of the Denver Broncos, playing a playoff game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And again, the NFL not having a rule against writing on eye black, he wrote for that game, John 3.16, once again, knowing that the texture of his life was drawing people's attention to Jesus. And it was during that game in which he wrote John 3, 16, the eye black of his eyes, that he threw for 316 yards. He was had 10 completions, averaging 31.6 yards per completion. His average yards per rush was 3.16 the Pittsburgh Steelers' time of possession was 31 minutes and 6 seconds. And ABC's ratings on that day was 31.6. And after that game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16. 
One of the things I love about my God is that he is not limited by space nor time. He's not limited to speaking only through Scripture, though that is his primary source of revelation of his Son to the world. That he orchestrates all things to draw everyone's attention to his Son. We will give our attention to something. We will pay attention to something or someone. So the question is this, what are you giving your attention to? God has been every day of your life, every day of my life, he continues to orchestrate my life, your life, the situation, scenarios, and circumstances in our lives to draw our attention to Jesus. What are you paying attention to? As I look at our current culture and this current generation, what I find is that this generation is seeking the same thing that every previous generation has sought. Every generation seeks the exact same thing. The expressions look differently, but the search is the same. And what I find in this culture and for this generation is we see a world in conflict and we're crying out for peace. What I see is a political turmoil and there's a cry for civility. What I see is this ethnic and social division and there's a cry for kindness and equity. The world of social media is simply a cry to be noticed, to be accepted, and for belonging. It's the exact same search every generation has sought before. The scenarios look different, but the search is the same. We're looking for good things. We're just looking in the wrong places. Enter Christmas. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the most famous verse in all the scripture. People all over the world, if they've memorized one verse, it's been this one. It's so simplistic, people lose the significance of it. It's so familiar, people cease to be it, fall in wonder because of it. This is all of Scripture wrapped up in one verse. This is Christmas wrapped up in one verse. If you were to lose all of other Scripture except for this one verse, this would be enough to lead every person in the world to Christ. It's one of my favorite, my absolute favorite in all of the Bible. And I've said this of other things around the Bible. I'll say it certainly about this verse. This is shallow enough for a child to wade in and deep enough for an elephant to swim in. I want us to be reminded of the simplicity of it and the profound depth of it all at once. And I want to remind us of this God that loves us so much so that he would send his son for us. And in response to his love, Respond. John 3, 16, Christmas. For God so loved the world. Love is not just what God does. Love is who God is. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. Love is the character. Love is the moral character. Love is the essence of who God is. God is love. It's just not what he does, though he does love. It is the essence of who God is. And we have to understand this about God's love. And I think if you've been in church any length of time, we've forgotten how profound this statement is. God is love. God's love is uncaused. In other words, we've not done anything to cause God to love us. He just loves us. It is uncaused. There's nothing you or I could do that would make God love us more. And there's nothing you or I could do that would make God love us less. It is uncaused. He loves you. 
And it is so profoundly different than the way we love each other. We love someone, we love something because of what it causes in us. There's a quality, there's a character about the people we love or the things we love that make us love them. As for example, I love nacho cheese. There's something about the quality and character of nacho cheese that I, you put nacho cheese on anything, it instantly makes it better as far as I'm concerned. I love my bulldogs. Diesel and Daisy, perfect creations of the Father as far as I'm concerned. I love the way they look. I love the way they act. I love the way their little tail and their little butt wiggles. I love their slobber. I love what cowards they are. I love their big old fat bellies. I just love them. They do something in me that makes me be drawn to them. I love my grandsons, Miles and Waylon. There's nothing like the love of a grandbaby. And they produce something in this, in this Pop Pop's heart. They're unique and different. But, but see, we love people. We love things because of what they cause in us. That's so profoundly different than God's love for us. We have done nothing that makes God love us. He just loves And we can do nothing that would make him unlove us. He just loves. His love is completely uncaused. There's nothing you can do. There's no behavior you can perform. There's no righteousness you can attain. There's no obedience you can do that makes God love you any more than he does right now. And if you are far away from him, There's no sin that you could commit. There's no shame that you could gain. There's no guilt that you could level against yourself that would make God love you less. It is uncaused. It's not about you. It's about him, his love. Not only is God's love uncaused, God's love is also unchanging. He was fully for you before you were ever even cognizant of him. It is unchanging. There's nothing you could do. There's nothing I could do that would make him change his love towards you. That's profound to me. If you are like me, you have had people in your life that have one time said they loved you that no longer do. And if they say they still do, they don't act like it. That's not God. It is unchanging. And it's so profound. It's so deep. It's so powerful. Because there's nothing in this world that compares to God's love. You've done nothing to earn it. You could do nothing to get rid of it. And you can do nothing to change it. It is uncaused. It is unchanging. And it is unaffected. God's love for you is unaffected by what you do. It's unaffected by what you don't do. It's unaffected. You cannot color, change, manipulate God's love. It's unaffected. For God so loved, because that's who he is, regardless of who I am, regardless of who you are. This word love, the first time John used it is in this verse. And that word love is the Greek word agape, agape agapeo. And it means unconditional. There's no condition you can put on God's love that would change it or affect it in any way whatsoever. He loves you. This was an incredible statement to be written at this time that for God so loved. Because up to this point, every God of every religion was an angry, demanding God. And man must appease and satisfy that God's anger. That that, that was the course of every other religion. And so the fact that John would write, for God so loved, was profound. See, the power and uniqueness of the Christian faith is that God has been satisfied, not by what we've done, but by the life and death of his son. Why? Because God so loved. So I can stand before this God who loves me so profoundly in spite of me, and God is completely satisfied and appeased of from my sin, not by what I've done, but by Jesus himself. Because God so loved. 
Every other religion in the world still to this day teaches that man must somehow satisfy an angry God by our performance and our behavior. It's only Christianity that teaches that God has already been satisfied and has already been appeased through the death of Christ. Why? Because God so loved. Jesus is the satisfaction of God. And you and I have to no longer try to appease him. You and I have to try no longer to please him. He is pleased because he is love. He loves us. And he is pleased to give his son for us. Because God's love is unconditional, Christmas. The power of this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The power of that verse is in that little word, so. This is the most powerful word in this entire verse. Why? Why? Because what that word so means is that God loved in such a special and unique way that he did something for us we were not able to do for ourselves. He loved us profoundly to the extent of so that he chose to act and move on our behalf in a way we could not move on our own. That word so implies a coming action. So the eternal previous statement is that for God so loved, is that he loved, and he loved so much so that he gave. There's an implied coming action. God's love is eternal, and because God's love is eternal, the implied coming action is that he would give his son for us. The uniqueness about God's love is that it is given not just to the world. It's not that God is some cosmic Uh, environmentalist, though he loves his creation over every act of creation, he pronounced it good, which the Hebrew word means beautiful. He loves all of creation and will one day redeem all of creation. But the implied coming action of his love is centered on you and me, that which can love him back. Trees, plants, rocks, and animals cannot love God back. You and I can And so the implied coming action of giving of his son is pointed at us because we can love him back. So his love is directed at you. His love is directed at me. I was talking to one of the junior high girls uh, a couple months ago as I'm teaching them on, on Monday evenings, and we were talking about this idea of the uniqueness of Christianity and how she could explain that to her father, which was just a great conversation to have from a young lady anyway. And one of the things I was trying to help her understand, that I want to help you understand, is that this God is so unique and his love is so profound that it's pointed at people who can love him back. And and, and God is the only answer. The, the, The answer of God answers every question of man. See, there are three, there are three bridges that that science or evolution cannot cross. Three bridges. One of them is the bridge from nothing to something. Science, evolution, whatever, has no answer from nothing to something. It it all starts that there existed something and it became something. There's no answer in science or evolution from nothing to something. And even if they could provide an answer from nothing to something, there's no answer for the second bridge from something to life. Because you can have elements, but elements don't make life. God's the only answer from nothing to something and from something to life. But even if someone could come up with the idea other than God from something to life, there's this third bridge it cannot come, cannot cross, which is from life to consciousness. A tree has life, but it has no conscience. There's no understanding of right and wrong, of morality, of love. It's only God who is so unique and so other, who chose to bestow his love upon that which can love him back, you and me, for God so loved the world. And his love was so profound that he gave his one and only son. 
God is love. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. See, love always finds expression. Love is never without expression. Love always finds expression. And the expression of God's love is that he gave. It's as if God thought, how can I express my love for these people? What can I do that, what can I give them that would express the full extent of my love? And he put his hand on his son's shoulder. He says, I have one way to express the profoundness of my love for them. My love must be expressed. And the best way I have to express my love is through my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This is the opposite of us. This is so contrary to who we are. This is not how we love. See, we give hoping to receive love. But God loves and so he gives. This is how our lives are structured. We know no other. We give ourselves away hoping to receive love from somebody. We give our bodies to somebody hoping to receive love from them. And God loves, so then he gives. See, the power of love is found in its expression. This is how love works. The power, the depth, the quality of love is found in its expression. This is why the Bible says in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates, he shows, he expresses his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christmas, he gave his son to die for us. You know why God outgives us? Because he outloves us. There's nothing we could do that would equal the expression of his love for us back to him. There's nothing we could do that would equal that expression. He outgives us because he outloves us. And that's why his love is unaffected and unchanged and unadulterated because there's nothing we can do that would equal the expression of his love towards us. We can't change it. It just, he just loves. And when you realize the extravagance of his love, When you realize how profound, how deep, how pure, how beautiful it is, it washes away every regret that you're still living with. When you understand the profoundness and death and beauty of his love, it liberates you from every guilt that you're still carrying, trying to make yourself right with him. When you understand the beauty and the power and the depth of his love, it quiets the voices of failure that resound in your head. He loves you. Profoundly. You and I don't have to perform for him. You and I don't have to carry around the guilt and shame and regrets. Thinking that the more remorseful we are over him, the more he'll be satisfied. He is satisfied in his son. He's chosen to lavish his love upon you and upon me. Oh, what manner of love it is that we should be called children of God, the Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, God's love is extravagant and God's love is expansive. Whoever believes in him. This means there are no exceptions. This means there are no exclusions. Whomever means whomever. Regardless of your past, in spite of your future, no matter your present. Whomever means whomever. Regardless of what you're done, regardless of what you're currently doing, and regardless of what you will do. Whomever means whomever. This is crazy that a Jewish man would write these words about God. Because for the Jew, culturally in this context, a Jew simply believed that non-Jews or Gentiles existed to stoke the fires of hell. And for Gentiles, non-Jews, to be included in this Jewish writing, that if they believed, 
they get eternal life. This was crazy. It's profound. I don't know what I can do to make you understand how, how revolutionary this idea is. It would be maybe like some right-wing MAGA militant saying, if Obama, if Biden, if Newsom, whomever, It, w- it, would, it would be like some, some lefty liberal saying if DeSantis, if Abbott, if Trump, whomever. Like, like it, on opposite poles, if they say even you, whomever, whomever, regardless, whomever believes No exception, no exclusion. And though the invitation is to whomever, if you are a whomever, this invitation is for you. To receive and experience and live in the context currently of this incredible love of God, this invitation, if you are a whomever, this is for you. However, if you reject this love, it is of no benefit to you. Love offered unaccepted is of no benefit to you. You understand this. I like to say it like this. Love that is unexpressed is only sentiment. Love that is not accepted is forever wasted. God's love is not sentiment because it is expressed. He expressed it in the giving of his son. Though it is an extravagant, expansive invitation, if it is not accepted, it is wasted. And if you do not accept the love of God through his son, you have wasted this expansive, extravagant gift. See, the benefit of God's love is only for those who have believed in him, that whoever believes in him, and that belief is not intellectual. That belief is personal. It's not about an intellectual understanding. It is about a transformational choice. That I believe that Jesus is the only way, and I have aligned my life with him in belief. And it fleshes itself out, not so that God will love me, but because he already has chosen to. Because I know I cannot affect his love. I can't earn it. I can't make him love me more. And so I just respond. And though God's love is expansive and amazing, it is also exclusive. That whoever believes, what are the next two words? In him. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And it is an expansive, extravagant gift but it is exclusive to faith in Christ. And that's the only way you gain the benefit of God's love in your life. And the benefit of God's love in accepting them shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is Christmas. Now, as far as I've done some research this week because I wanted to make sure I had my facts straight. And as far as I can tell in America, I think it's the same every place on the globe. I, I think I got my facts right. But at this point, it's just about 100% mortality rate for humans. I, I think I got my facts straight. That every one of us is going to die. And so when the Bible says shall not perish, it doesn't mean not physically die. It means not eternally die. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. We will still die and move from this world into eternity. And for those who have placed their faith in Jesus, who have received God's love, that is a joyful transition. Because we move from a temporary tent to an eternal home. We move from being an alien in this world to our true country, our true land. 
And it is a joyful transition for those who are in Christ who have accepted the love of God. The fact is that the soul was created to live forever in eternal life or in eternal death. And the benefit of receiving God's love is the reception of eternal life rather than the consequence of eternal death. We will all live forever. Some of us live, will live in eternal life with the Father because of the Son and what we call heaven. But souls will live forever. Others will live eternally separated from God and what the Bible calls hell. And the benefit of receiving the love of God is eternal life with the soul in heaven. Now, the good thing about eternal life, this verse says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is not something you have to wait for to receive for when you die. Eternal life is yours right now. See, there's a difference between being alive and being eternally alive. And when you believe in Jesus, you get eternal life right now. My eternal life has begun. I made sure of that on February 19th, 1983 at winter camp up at Sugar Pine Christian Camp. I made certain of that, that my eternal life begun that day that I know without a doubt. And from that day on, I have lived in eternal life and I'm living it right now. I don't have to wait till I die to receive that. It's mine right now. And so I can live with this perspective that I am living eternally with God right now, and it changes everything about this world. That's the benefit of receiving the eternal love of an eternal God and receiving eternal life. That I have life and not death, and I have life that transcends and changes the pains of my past, and I have life over the hurts, habits, and hangups that might affect. I have life right now. And so can you. I have life. And the freedom and liberation from the sin, the consequence of sin. And so can you. Some of you, though you believe in Jesus, have been living a dead life. Because you've not understood the eternal life that can be yours right now. See, this is the gift of Christmas, and it is wonderful. And it is the invitation for every one of us. And so now, there's only one question. In light of God and his love for you, what's your response? What's your response? you can't choose a response that will make God love you anymore. And nor can you choose a response that will make God love you less. His love is unchanged. It's unaffected. It's uncaused. There's no decision you can make today that would make God love you any more or any less. But there is a decision you can make today. That's a proper response because of his love. There is a response today. That would allow you to gain the benefit of his love. Because God loves you so much, what is your response? I'm really thankful that we've had little ones in church today. Because I was about three years old, or in third grade, when I sat in church with my parents. And I heard from our pastor, John Epp, about the love of God. And it started laying this foundation for me. And understanding his love that put me 
at the place where I could be on February 19th, 1983, of giving him my whole life. You are not too young to hear that Jesus loves you and that he died on the cross for you and he wants to spend eternity with you in heaven. You are not too young. You can understand this. And if the little ones can understand it, you big ones can understand it. Don't miss the benefit of his love. Those of you who have understood it in the past and have ceased being amazed by it in the present, I want to invite you back to the wonderment of it. Because it is beautiful and unending. I want you to pray with me. Father, I thank you that you loved me, that you loved us so much, that you gave your one and only son, that if we would just believe in you, we would not perish but have right now eternal life, it's such good, profound news. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would amaze us by it again. Friends, in this place of quietness, if you have never accepted the love of God, I want to invite you to do that. And for some of you, if you have ceased being amazed by it, I want to invite you back into the amazement of it. And in this moment, I just want to encourage you to say something along the lines. Father, thank you that you love me. And that love is uncaused and unchanging. Today, I choose to love you back. I accept your love for me. I accept the forgiveness that you've given me. I accept you as my Lord and the leader of my life. I choose to be amazed at your love. And I would encourage you in this time, whatever this looks like for you, and I don't want to give you words, I just want to put you in the position to respond. Just say, Father, in light of your love, this is my response, and you fill in the blank. God, because you loved me so much, my response to that love is... Father, I thank you for Christmas. That it is the expression of your love. I pray that none of us walk from this place without being overwhelmed by it and grateful for it. I pray that the remembrance of your love would so color and transform the experience of this day and tomorrow that we would live in the realization of eternal life right now because of your love help us to love you more. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I was fortunate enough to have parents who understood enough to be able to give me a foundation for my faith, what the Christian faith was really about. I was fortunate to have parents who, who, who understood enough about the Bible and, and, and some theology and some doctrine that helped me have a, have a foundation and a, and a framework from which to grow. And so what I'm, I want to give you a gift. This is a little book I've written. Some of you have had it already, but if you haven't, I want you to feel free to pick one up. It's just called Foundations. 
It's really simply written, but it'll give you a foundation of what we've talked about, salvation, about sin, about hell, about heaven, about the Bible, about your giftedness. Uh, and so I want, you to, I want you to be able to grow in your faith and knowledge of, of, of what it is to be a Christ follower. And especially if you're a big one who has little ones, you need to know this well enough so you can translate it for your little ones to give them a foundation. Does that make sense? And so if you want to, I invite you to stop by the start here booth. We, we got a box full of them. Just get one of these. It's, it's my gift. It's Christmas time. I feel like I, I got to give you a gift. So, so this is my gift to you. Make use of it. And listen, I love you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. <laughs> Lord, I appreciate you, Lord. You get it. You get it. Yeah. I heard a little quiet over here, but not very much from you, Caleb. I'm a little disappointed. You got a mic. You could have been loud, but I'm. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. I do love you, and I love getting to open up the Bible and pursuing this incredible God together with you. If you don't have a church home, if you're visiting, you got church home back home, freaking throw yourself into the thing when you get back. But if you don't have a church home, you're welcome here. I'd love for you to be a part of this family. Next week, one service, 10 o'clock, you're going to get to hear from some of the staff about what God's been doing in our lives, kind of behind the scenes that we don't talk about much. And then at the first of the year, we're back in at 9 and, uh, and 10.30. You're welcome here. And you're welcome here because God loves you. And I love you. Caleb, yeah. let's sing a song. You got something about Jesus or Christmas? I think we could do something like Figure that. Figure something out? Yeah. All right, let's sing.